Hello everyone. Today's topic is lightweight blog ciphers. So, so far we discussed uh, Internet of Things and devices that we are going to be dealing with. And we talk about why we need lightweight cryptography or uh, lightweight encryption algorithms. So now it is time to talk about lightweight encryption algorithms and we will be starting with blog ciphers. So most of the encryption in the world actually is done by blog ciphers, but uh, and most of the time we are using advanced encryption standard, AES, but for the lightweight devices and uh, for small devices that we are using uh, in uh, Internet of Things, we will be needing lightweight encryption algorithms. So our focus will be on lightweight block ciphers. So instead of uh, modern ciphers that we are using in our desktop computers or laptops, we will be focusing on lightweight standards, and there are actually three ISO standards currently, uh, and we will be talking about those three block ciphers, namely height, present, and clavier. So uh, this encryption will be performed between devices. So in order for that, the devices should be talking the same language, right? And actually, this is done by encoding. Historical ciphers mostly operate on letters since they are pen and paper methods, but now we are living in a digital world. When working with digital data, we can represent characters as strings of bits. And if you uh, gather eight bits together, we call it a byte. And most of the time, we will be re representing a character as a byte. And this is what we do in an actual digital world. So, the communicating parties must first agree on an encoding, so they will be speaking the same language. So the most famous, I think, the encoding technique is the ASCII. So most probably you already know the ASCII tables, because this is the American standard that most of the time we are using it. But of course, this table does not contain every uh, character, because in some languages, uh, in some Latin languages, there are characters that are not included in this ASCII table. And Turkish is an example for that. Uh, there are many letters in Turkish that are not included in this uh, table, namely the letters like Ö or G. So in those cases, you have to be using a different encoding, like UTF-8 and similar encodings. And uh, depending on your encoding, sometimes you might be using two bytes to represent a character. So let's recall what the ASCII table was. Uh, the, f uh, the first, so uh, we will be using a byte to represent the character in this table. So you have eight bits, and with eight bits, you can represent two to the eight different characters. So this means that you can at most uh, represent 256 different characters uh, with a byte. This, for this reason, this table starts from zero to 255. The second part is the extended part. There are some letters that are not used in actually in English, but in other uh, Latin languages like French and so on. Uh, but this is the main part. And the part that you can, that are considered printable characters are here. And actually the letters uh, start from here. And these are the capital ones and these are the small ones and so on. So again, uh, we are just assuming that the communicating devices are talking the same language and they understand each other. So for the rest of the course, we won't be dealing with the encoding. We just assume that uh, there is an agreed upon encoding. And you might think that this is something unimportant and since it is now 2020, this is a problem that has already been solved, but we are still receiving emails uh, or sending emails and people returning saying that I couldn't see the Turkish characters in your email, can you send it again and so on. So uh, it is something people still cannot solve, let's say. So let's look at the cryptography goals. So cryptography solves a lot of problems in terms of uh, confidentiality, authentication or integrity and so on. At the confidentiality part where the encryption comes into play, you can solve this problem with block ciphers, stream ciphers, or you can use public key encryption algorithms like RSA, or you can use authenticated encryption algorithms, which both solves the confidentiality problem, but also the data authentication problem. But also data authentication can be 
uh, provided by using hash functions, which actually uh, provides integrity. You can use message authentication codes. And for the entity authentication, you can use digital signatures, again, MAC algorithms or zero knowledge proofs and so on. Also for the origin and repetition, we use digital signatures. So cryptography solves a lot of problems. So this is the kind of a big picture. Of course, cryptography has a lot of different areas which cannot be put inside this picture, like post-quantum cryptography and so on, so or uh, randomness and so on. So there are a lot of sub uh, categories, but these are the some of the main areas of cryptography. So in this lecture, we are dealing with lightweight algorithms. So we need lightweight block ciphers, lightweight stream ciphers, or lightweight authentication algorithms, lightweight hash functions, and so on. So most of the time, we will be focusing at this part in this lecture. So we start with block ciphers. And you, maybe we can divide cryptographic algorithms into two classes. Some algorithms do not use a key, like cryptographic hash functions, because there is no encryption performed there. And this is important because we still hear uh, some lectures or uh, talks where people talk about hash functions as if they are an encryption algorithm, but there is no encryption here. Okay, uh, we will be talking about hash functions in a few weeks, I guess. And in the key part, you have the symmetric and asymmetric key part. And for the uh, symmetric key, which is also known as secret key cryptography, there, these algorithms are. Uh, share this common uh, property. Secret key algorithms use the same key material for both encryption and decryption, hence the name symmetric key cryptography. There are three types of algorithms in this category, block ciphers, stream ciphers, and message authentication codes, which, is can, which can be shortened as MAX. So we will be at this part of the picture, and uh, we will be talking about uh, stream ciphers message authentication codes later. We will be also talking about lightweight hash functions. But uh, most importantly, we will be talking about authenticated encryption algorithms. And you can obtain such algorithms by combining a block cipher with a MAC or a stream cipher with a MAC. But we, will be, we are currently having a competition uh, organized by NIST. And in that uh, competition, uh, authenticated encryption algorithms are computing. So in order to understand those parts, uh, it is a good place to start with block ciphers. And actually, in this lecture, we won't be talking much about uh, asymmetric key cryptography because the algorithms here uh, actually require a lot of computational power. And there are uh, protocols or algorithms which provide short uh, signatures and so on. But uh, for this course, we will be talking about devices which has very limited memory and very limited computational power, which are not suitable for most of the algorithms there in the area of public key cryptography. So we will be focusing on most of the time the symmetric key part. So in our picture, we are here with the block ciphers. So block ciphers and stream ciphers are encryption primitives, while the message authentication code is used for data and data origin authentication. So again, there is no encryption there. It only provides authentication. But if you, as I told before, if you combine an encryption algorithm with a uh, message authentication code, you get an uh, authenticated encryption algorithm, which is actually used in practice. But we prefer a dedicated algorithm which provides both encryption and the authentication. So this is why we have uh, in the competition NIST uh, ask for authenticated encryption algorithms. And uh, these three topics are not completely uh, independent of each other. We can use a block cipher to build a stream cipher. And if you change the mode of operation, actually a block cipher turns into a stream cipher or you can create a message authentication code from a block cipher. You can even uh, design a hash function by a block cipher. So in order to understand all of these topics, we have to know them independently and ha have to look at the picture at the end to see the whole picture. And asymmetric key crypto systems have different types of algorithms. Uh, they include algorithms like key agreement algorithms, public key encryption algorithms like RSA or Algamal, and digital signature algorithms and so on. But as I told you before, in this lecture, in this course, we won't be dealing much with asymmetric crypto systems. 
but if you're interested you can uh, look at my other course where uh, we will be talking about asymmetric key crypto systems at the end of that course which is uh, titled applied cryptology okay so let's start with some definition first what is a crypto system or a cipher a plain text is what you want to protect and a plain text can be a um, whatsapp message you are sending an sms message you are sending or a file in your computer so it is the, or when you're talking it is the, your voice so it is the thing that you want to protect a crypto system is pair of algorithms that convert plain text to cipher text and back cipher text is the encrypted version of the plain text cipher text should appear like a random so a crypto system or a cipher is just a pair of algorithms which performs encryption and decryption oper operations. And we need that because uh, we are assuming that the communication channel we are using is insecure. And this is almost always the case. It doesn't matter if it is a wired or a wireless communication, somebody can always intercept the communication. So we are assuming that somebody can listen to the communication. For this reason, we want to turn our plain text into something unintelligible. So and we will be confident that anybody capturing the cipher text would not get any information about the plain text. But the person who has who we are communicating to or the device has a secret information that we call a secret key, uh, can decrypt this message and obtain the plain text. So this is the main idea. And for the symmetric key crypto systems, this key uh, is used for both encryption and decryption. So encryption and decryption keys either identical or they are very related to each other. So you can obtain one from the other one. But this is not the case in asymmetric key crypto systems. But again, uh, it is not the topic of this uh, course. So let's look at uh, block ciphers. Block ciphers operate on bit blocks of data. Plain text is divided into bit blocks. Each block is encrypted by a, a k-bit secret key to produce bit output. Output blocks form the ciphertext, but how you form it actually depends on your choice of your mode of operation. And mode of operation is the uh, topic of my next lecture. So for the rest of this lecture, just assume that we are only trying to encrypt B bits of data, okay? We will be talking about how we can encrypt anything larger than or less than B bits, okay? That will be related to mode of operations, but for, for this lecture, for the simplicity, just assume that we only need to encrypt B bits of data and these algorithms take input as B bit uh, data and provides B bit output. So your plain text is actually B bit and we will be providing a B bit cipher text. So your input can have uh, two to the B different values because you are encrypting B bits and you are mapping to the same set again to the B elements. So your choice of key and your encryption algorithm is actually uh, turns into a permutation. So these elements sent that to themselves, but in a different order. So uh, actually designing a good block cipher means that you, you design such an algorithm and when you choose a random key, this permutation also looks random and does not have trivial weaknesses, let's say. Nowadays, the block size B is chosen as uh, 64 bits or 128 bits, so either 8 bytes or 16 bytes. But this course is about lightweight block ciphers. And in uh, literature, we can see lightweight algorithms that has block size of 32 bits, which is just uh, 4 bytes. So there is no uh, direct weakness of using short blocks but if you make it really short then uh, the possible input size becomes small so somebody who is listening to the communication might obtain a lot of uh, plain text blocks and corresponding cipher text blocks which makes the cipher kind of uh, sorry the encryption process kind of weak because if you can capture every two to the B plain text and corresponding cipher text and store them in a table, then you can perform an attack where you still don't know the key, but just by looking at the table, you can uh, obtain the plain text from cipher text or cipher text from the plain text. So 
the blocks are shouldn't be that very small. If it is small, you have to be changing your secret key very frequently. But these block sizes are somewhat more secure. And uh, if you choose a long key, like 128 bits or larger, you will be secure. And some people think that, uh, actually, I talked about this before in our previous lectures. Uh, some people think that lightweight cryptography is about short keys. Uh, but uh, designing a lightweight algorithm doesn't mean that the key has to be short. In fact, uh, if your key size is 8 bits or shorter, then I believe that uh, it is no longer secure. Even uh, people who has uh, good GPUs, but millions of them can gather on the internet and uh, perform an exhaustive search attack on short keys. So uh, in my opinion, there's no point of using any secret key that is shorter than 128 bits. There's no reason to live at the edge. But we, be, uh, we believe that this uh, length is secure for the time being and for the uh, visible feature, let's say. So uh, we said that uh, encryption algorithm actually turns uh, is just a permutation. When you choose the secret key, you are actually performing a permutation operation. But from two to the B elements to the two to the B elements, you can actually uh, have this many permutations, which is two to the B factorial. And this is approximately two to the B minus one times two to the B. As you can see, this is a very huge number depending on the B. But once you choose a key, actually you can choose two to the k different secret keys this means that the encryption algorithm you choose and the possible keys that you can choose actually is a small subset of this very huge permutation space so uh, for security for any chosen key we expect a good block cipher to act like as if it is a random selected permutation even more, we expect no relation between permutations that are obtained by keys that are related somehow. So this is actually about cryptanalysis and uh, about related key cryptanalysis. But so far, just uh, I'm talking about this to give you the big picture. 